Is this working? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think we'll start without John uh, Pasteur. We we'll hope, hope he comes. He should. He's indebted to me for life, so he should be here. Um, tonight, uh, I want to give an explanation of the panel of what this is. Uh, there's uh, David Greenberg, uh, who is in environmental communications, and he started it. And uh, they basically uh, have material that they send out all, all over the world educating architects on what they should be doing. And uh, then there's Rick Davison, who's a political activist, and uh, Elsa Fleischman, who is a uh, educated as an architect, um, is a landscape architect, and is a mother in that order. And uh, myself, who I classify as a visionary. Uh, <laughs> a very bitter visionary. Um, and John Pasteur, who is a critic of the Architectural Times, who fired, so ex-critic. And what we have in common is that we're all, we're all educated as architects and uh, not practicing in the mainstream of architecture as it's uh, done professionally. And that's about it, what we have in common. You'll find a lot of disagreements. You'll find a great range of, from conservatives to radicalism and and I don't think anybody agrees on anything. They might agree on certain things, but not totally. So it's not a panel made up of people arguing or fighting. It's a panel of just presenting different ideas why we are in the position we are now in our professional lives. OK, we'll start with Rick Davison. And uh, let's see how. Is it, we only have one of these more? We just pass it around? Can you hear me, or do I need the mic? Yeah, you need a mic. This is all. Oh, you got the mic. I don't know. I have a mic. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what Glenn had in mind, but as I understand it, uh, talk a little bit about uh, where I came from and how I uh, got from the practice of architecture into uh, whatever I'm doing now, and uh, I. I'm from Florida, and I graduated from the University of Florida, and after that was practicing architecture in uh, Miami uh, in a small architectural office, having worked in a couple large ones and doing sort of like the ideal practice of architecture. Uh, working with Marion Manley, a woman architect uh, registered in 1918, uh, was a tremendous character in herself, and just the two of us in the office, and. You know, we had two or three schools going, and a couple of churches going, and about four or five houses going, and uh, some work at the University of Miami, and it was just ideal. Uh, we not only had a lot of work, but it was space so that we could do a lot of other things. She was a fellow, sure, is a fellow of the Institute, and was very active in the American Institute of Architects. And about two or three years after I'd been out of college, uh, <clears throat> went to AIA convention in Orlando, Florida. This is about 1958, which Buck Minister Fuller was the guest speaker. And uh, he blew my mind, and he was going to have a seminar, about a four-week seminar at the University of Florida. I made arrangements to go back to the University of Florida, myself, an architect from Sarasota, who was also very impressed. And uh, we spent almost 24 hours a day uh, with Fuller. And um, when I came back, I was a different person. I saw the world differently. I was extremely pissed off because I went through five years of architecture and someone says, oh yeah, there's a guy named Fuller and he's an engineer of some sorts and he does geodesic domes. And that's all you knew of Fuller in 1958, unless you happen to be at North Carolina or some particular school where he was actually uh, participating. So I just went back to Miami and worked all day in architecture and all night on ideas that just kept flowing and going crazy. 
and uh, one led to another. I was like uh, a freshman in physics that just had his first course in physics and started relating to all the energies and all the possibilities. And uh, aside from being very exciting, it just opened up a whole new world. <clears throat> and I started playing around with, you know, what do you do with the energies in the universe, the Gulf Stream, and so forth and so on. My stepfather was a very well-known heart specialist in Miami, had a hospital and could open almost any door in Florida and the East Coast to me. And so as these ideas started developing, he opened the doors and I started going talking to these people. And all of a sudden started getting beat on the head, uh, particularly around housing, uh, particularly around housing for the black community. Uh, and Eventually, what I started working on got me in trouble, and so my dear stepfather invited me into his office, shot some drugs into me, and I woke up you know, in a padded cell. It took me about two weeks, two and a half, three weeks to talk my way out of that, and I got the hell out of Florida. I said, something's going wrong. You know, Bucky's a nice guy, but... <laughs> well, I got on a sailboat and uh, sailed around the Caribbean and Central and South America and had a nice little island in the sun floating, and I was really dropping out. So I dropped out, but I, in the process, we sailed through the Panama Canal in 1960. Well, the Panamanians were marching on the canal zone. They were overturning cars, they burned the American flag. There's all sorts of talk about imperialism and colonialism. And we were a few weeks down there, and I said, well, I can't seem to get away. I guess my floating island in the sun, although I can't see America, wherever I go, I'm influenced by it. And I don't like what I see. And what I understand. So I drifted back up to Central America and ended up in Los Angeles. And although I loved architecture prior to that, I couldn't practice architecture. There were too many other priorities, but also there were too many unknowns. I, I didn't understand what the hell was happening in my world. I couldn't understand you know, what was going on. And so I bounced around LA for a while. I tried to write some poems. I tried to write editorials. I had a little theater in Hollywood. I tried to write some plays. Uh, and then the Vietnam War experience hit me. Uh, 1963, I was doing some architectural work in the Arctic. Met 12 Green Berets just back from Vietnam. We are in a small Eskimo village in the north slope of Alaska, about 40 below zero. And here these maniacs were sitting around telling how great it was to kill people. So I came back and I just couldn't get into practice of architecture. And uh, started with uh, a group of people trying to talk about new politics in California, uh, the angry arts, they built a peace tower on Sunset Boulevard, and artists all over the world donated their art. We had walks up and down La Cienega Boulevard. Artists were destroying their paintings, burning them, anything to protest the war. At the time, uh, to, in order to make a living, because I found out I couldn't make a living except through architecture, I was working with Walt Disney, uh, his firm, uh, Wed Enterprises in Glendale. And I started talking about the war. What the hell, we can't just sit here. You know, what are we doing? Uh, brought in speakers, tried to start. Uh, we had, uh, had a patio right outside the cafeteria where everyone would have their lunch, tried to get you know, discussions going. The only person that was interested in the entire Disney enterprise <laughs> that I could see was a right winger. And so we yelled and screamed at each other, but we were the only ones, and we became close friends. He was very pro-war, and I was anti-war. Well, that experience, I was finally fired from Disney. Uh, and that left me with a little bit of money in my pocket. My first, my, or I was divorced and what to do with the war. Uh, so I decided, well, I just put all my energies into it. And that's basically where I've been ever since, about 67, and that I do a little bit of architecture, some remodeling or whatever, to keep my head above water, and the rest goes into trying to change the priorities of this society. I don't believe it's gonna change except through a civil war. I think it'll probably be the bloodiest civil war the country's ever seen, the world's ever seen. And I say that growing up from the South and reading the 
about the civil war that we had, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, I work as hard as I can because I think the more people work, the more people get involved, change the priorities, will lessen the length and the hell of that civil war that's on the agenda. Uh, it blows my mind that people that talk about integrity and commitment and all these don't see the world as I see it. But having been in a padded cell, I learned a long time. Maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe that's what it's all about. I don't know. I don't think I'm crazy. Uh, and I'm, I keep thinking about, well, the youth is the only thing that's going to change this country. The youth is the only thing that woke this country up talking about the early 1960, started a group called SDS. I was already out of school. I didn't have anything to do with it from that point. But it's the only thing that grabbed this country by their ass and turned them around and says, hey, we've got to make some changes. Uh, so I have a great deal of hope and faith in that. Uh, what can happen when the youth of this country says, wait, we ain't buying this crap anymore. And I think it is changing. I think since the Vietnam War has come to a conclusion, I think a lot of people are doing some thinking and studying. And I think the next 10 years are going to tell us just how much we learned through the Vietnam experience. And I guess that's what really changed me, so where I can no longer go back to the practice of architecture. I can no longer go back to what I was as just one nice guy growing up in the South, living a nice life. Lynn? All right. Um, David? Mm -hmm. okay. What we're going to do is uh, each person is going to speak for around 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll get into a question and answer period with the audience, hoping to get, you'll ask them questions and everything and learn more. <clears throat> Uh, to begin with, I wasn't sure exactly uh, what the format of this whole thing was going to be, and I brought some slides because that's basically what I'm doing these days, and I don't know how to talk without slides anyway. So we're just going to see a barrage of slides, and what I'm going to talk about doesn't relate directly to any individual given image. But uh, basically what I've been into for a while uh, at Environmental Communications for the past six years is learning from Los Angeles, so we're going to see a lot of slides. Uh, and the order isn't even particularly, uh, mean, you know, the, there's no particular order. It's, it's just Los Angeles. I, I was born and uh, brought up in West Hollywood. Uh, went to school here in Los Angeles, and then uh, but got bad grades, and so I couldn't go to s college in California because I didn't have the grades. So, but I wanted to go to a university because somehow I felt, well, I didn't know what I wanted to do, and uh, I thought I would find out better at a university. So I, I, I went to Arizona State University, and after about, um, after about a year, I got into architecture thinking that architecture was perhaps the best well-rounded education I could get. And, which is what I was looking for. And, uh, and they gave, you know, they sort of, from the very beginning, gave a lot of lip service to, you know, all, you know, what architecture really entails is, uh, the education of architecture is everything, and from, uh, you know, mathematics to basically philosophy or whatever. But um, it didn't really happen. I guess it didn't happen. I got very bad grades at Arizona State University, uh, usually D's and F's. And, and <laughs> I, what, what, when, when I would design a project, I, I, I just couldn't go that last step that they wanted me to go. Um, <laughs> it was like, for instance, designing a monastery in school. I remember I got an F on that. And uh, I sort of got so involved with the, uh, you know, the philosophy of, of the monk and, and, you know, what, is, what does he really need, what does he really want, what does he not want, and, you know, which was basically architecture. And uh, so how do you, de <laughs> how do you design? Uh, 
anyway, it, it got to the point where a professor even sat me down in front of the, the drawings and said, well, if you put a window here and if you do this there and make it, you know, nice, then we'll get, we'll pass you. But anyway, somehow I, I graduated architecture, got a bachelor at Arizona State University, and uh, came to Los Angeles. Uh, the only thing I knew is that I didn't want to practice architecture. Uh, for some reason, there wasn't, uh, it, for me at that time, all I could see is continuing designing boxes for people uh, for one reason or another. If, if uh, it was too limited for, for, for what I, for me, besides the fact I felt I didn't learn anything in architecture school and I wanted to learn a little bit about architecture. The, one of the last projects, the last year in, archi in undergraduate at Arizona State University, I got into film and started making films of LA uh, for an urban planning class. I made a film of the uh, freeways and, and trying to understand what, uh, what architecture, what LA looks like, but in movement. And uh, the film camera, the Super 8 film camera, was really good at showing me that and began to just get an inkling of understanding that maybe, you know, LA was pretty far out. Uh, a lot of people, well, still don't think so, but, but uh, at that time it was just beginning, people were beginning to look at LA and the camera, following the camera around, uh, particularly the San Diego, Santa Monica freeway interchange, I, I got the film back one night and uh, was looking at the film and I said, my God, this is, uh, this is a piece of sculpture, this thing, this gigantic thing, these flowing ribbons of concrete in the air. And, and I was, I, at that point, I, the only thing I could do is just turn the camera, the movie camera on everything in LA and looked at everything from neon signs to, um, to billboards to, you know, architecture, cars, freeways, smog, pollution, uh, custom cars. Uh, suddenly everything in LA had a tremendous meaning for me and, and I didn't exactly, it was just basically learning. It was, it seemed to be from the beginning a kind of a direction, you know, a, a different direction of learning that I had had in school. Um, After about six months of doing this, this was in 1969, uh, we realized that there were a lot of other people were kind of turning onto these movies and these pictures of LA. And uh, so someone had the idea to start sending out some, um, just some mimograph sheets to university architecture departments around the country and to see if they'd be interested in buying some copies of these slides and films. And uh, there was an immediate interest, actually. It was small at first, but it grew uh, to the point where environmental communications uh, now, I think, distributes like 15 or 20,000 pictures of LA a month uh, to universities all over the world, uh, planning, uh, city planning departments and things. And um, there are about, I guess, about 12 people working at EC now. It started out, there were a core of, of four or five. Um, there was an architecture professor, uh, historical architecture professor from Arizona State University who coincidentally got fired the, the, the same semester I graduated. Um, actually, he got fired partially because of a film that I had made for his class and that he'd helped me with. And uh, it turned out that the school thought it was an obscene film. It was called The Toilet. The, the concept was that uh, not all the shit in the environment ends up in toilets. Uh, but can, can be seen around. Uh, and he, he was, uh, Doug White, this, this architectural historian, was, was, I guess, really got us onto the track of, because uh, we were just, you know, crazy people and photographers and things. And, and he really got us on the track to really orienting our pictures, our studies, uh, to university architecture departments and uh, thinking that, um, the students could get, you know, turned on by this stuff. A lot of the stuff, like in the center screen, uh, I noticed we've been seeing some of the historical stuff. There was, at that time in 1969, uh, there was not a lot of, uh, a lot of the important early historical stuff in, in LA. People like uh, Schindler and uh, I guess the Green Brothers to some extent and some other, other Gill were not really very, nationally famous or internationally famous. Very few people had heard about them. And it was a kind of a turn on for us to go around and take pictures of, of some of the historical stuff as well as some of the contemporary stuff. Um, the, 
the the thing on the, the on the left. Well, it's it's uh, they're, all the slides are mixed up, so there's not. Yeah, on the left um, happened. That's kind of I guess it's out of the late twenties, early thirties. It's in one of our slide series uh, called uh, Modern of Los Angeles. Uh, in the middle is from a slide series called, well, it's a dingbat, but it's from a slide series called Hardcore LA, and uh, which features things like dingbats. Um, there's a lovely dingbat. I, I think that the, the, the definition of a dingbat is a minimal multiple family dwelling residence, you know. Uh, that's kind of a dingbat motel, I guess. I don't know what else to call it. That, 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 that thing on the right, which is uh, probably my favorite billboard, um, is really, you know, I think it's one of the, it's been one of the great works of art hanging around LA, and uh, it, it's been up for a couple of years. I don't think it's up much right now, but uh, it's incredible. It's just, just incredible. <laughs> I'm still not sure exactly what we are learning from Los Angeles. I just get this feeling that we are learning something. And that all these, uh, all these images, when you put them all together, <laughs> uh, and, when you, and when you look at it all with kind of, on one level, objectively, <laughs> that's the pickle-mobile on the left. The cops finally uh, uh, confiscated it. That's the dick-mobile now. <laughs> That one they try to keep out of L.A. as much as possible. It comes down out of the mountains every once in a while. So. Mm. On, on the left is, is one of the real classic custom cars uh, done by George Barris a long time ago. Uh, the custom car movement since that was done, which I think was probably in the very early 50s, uh, has really gone out the other end. I mean, you've seen some examples of it. Um, The, the, the slides you're seeing in the center uh, is a slide series we distributed entitled Coffee Shops of L.A. And uh, these are the managers of the, of the coffee shops in L.A. <laughs> and uh, I think the, the bottom one is the Norms and the top one in the middle is Sambo's and the one on the top. Not sure. That's not really a custom car. That one was done for a movie, the one that you just saw on the left. Um, the, the, the center shot, for the people that don't know, are, are Ed, Edward Richet's <laughs> paintings that have been transferred onto slides. Um, here's a standard station burning. My favorite of his is actually the LA County Museum burning. I don't know if we're going to see it or not. This slide on the right is one of the really great billboards that's been up. Um, the detail is fantastic. If anybody ever got out of their car and walked over to that a couple of years ago when it was up, I mean, it's just really mind-blowing, uh, just w things that are happening. Can you focus that just a little bit, that one on the right? That's a particularly good one. It's a lot of focus. Probably uh, <clears throat> the, the, the slide series that are being shown on the right, the billboards, is, is one of the things that I've somehow grown to be most fond of as far as all our documentation of LA, um, the most personally turned on by. Um, I just recently had, was involved in a, in a court case. Uh, they called me in as a, because we have the slide series on billboards, as an expert witness in a 
big court case that's still being tried right now. Uh, it's in the middle of a very long trial. The, the outdoor advertising people are uh, suing the state of California because the state of California um, has outlawed all billboards within sight of landscape freeways in Southern California. Um, at this particular time, I'm, I'm sort of on the billboard side uh, in this case with respect to billboards by freeways. Um, I think it's kind of a natural place to have billboards by freeways. And um, what's happened is that essentially the landscape architects for the, or the landscapers of the freeways um, have, um, have a, this incredible purist attitude about their landscaping by the freeways. I mean, you know, there's this strip and they don't want anything to screw with it. Of course, there's all this crap right going down the middle, that stuff you just saw right down the middle of the freeways. And that doesn't bother them, you know, conflicting with the landscape, but the billboards on the other side, that that bothers them. And, and uh, it's kind of interesting that the, that the landscapers, and particularly the ones for the State Highway Division, uh, which is called Caltrans now, in case anybody doesn't know, uh, have such a purist attitude about it. Uh, particularly within the context of LA, it, it, it's, in, it's insane how anybody could have a purist attitude about anything in Los Angeles because there are very few things that are ever perceived by themselves. You know, there's always something weird next to something else. <laughs> and uh, my feeling is that, you know, we should just. Uh, that's uh, main, that's downtown 1907, the picture on the left. And that's a classic, one of the first hand-painted big billboards from the early 50s. You can tell it's old because she's wearing pedal pushers. That's LA 1917. This is LA today. <laughs> This was one of the areas, the area you just saw. Could you go back to that, that slide in the middle? This is one of the areas where they decided they didn't want any billboards, right at this part of this freeway there. That's uh, the busiest intersection in the world. Well over a half a million cars go over that intersection every day. That interchange, I should say. That's uh, in temporary storage right now. That was the old uh, Angel's Flight. That's the Nixon Freeway crossing the... <laughs> this is that big sculpture. I just want to read a few quotes just as we're finishing up with these slides. Uh, whoops, don't have them with me. Don't have them with me. Uh, but I, re I think I remember them. Uh, one of them, uh, and I'm not sure what it means exactly, but it was a, a, quote, a quote from Louis Kahn, who in 1972 said something like, uh, L.A. is truth, whether you like it or not. Um, the, uh, the other quote is, is out of uh, Castaneda's latest book called Tales of Power, which, uh, where Don Juan is talking and he says, uh, don't try to make any sense out of all that magnificence around you. Uh, and uh, the uh, third quote uh, is one out of a Rainer Banham's book on LA where he just warns uh, anybody uh, who tries to compare L.A. with anywhere else. You can just zip through the rest of them real fast. Those are Chicano murals on the right. That's from Strata Courts. It, 
If you took all the swimming pools in Los Angeles and lined them up side by side, they would reach all the way to San Francisco, actually slightly beyond San Francisco, about 500 miles of uh, swimming pools in LA, 20 feet wide. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. I'm John Pasteur, uh, and I'm here to prove to you that in a time of severe unemployment in architecture, there are alternatives to be unemployed <laughs> elsewhere. Uh, I think I'm becoming an academic next, but in my several lives, I was briefly thinking I was going to be an architect. I started out studying engineering. Uh, it was the 50s and there was scholarship money for stuff like that and we were going to beat the Russians. And after a year and a half of that, I looked around me and said, I can't relate to any of this. I can't relate to the courses, to, the, to my fellow uh, engineer students. Uh, I found myself spending a lot of time in the architectural library at Cornell. And finally the light bulb went on and I said, this is masochism. Uh, at that time, I came up with a brilliant rationalization for going into architecture that uh, somehow it was a good hybrid between the really hard scientific stuff that seemed to have a lot of validity and the humanistic, literary, intuitive stuff that also seemed to have a lot of validity. And it's probably true. That's uh, something very important about architecture that it's at a crossroads of two, two whole schools of thought that are usually separated in our society. And I think the problem is that uh, it, it's hard to stay at that crossroads as an individual. Uh, if you're in architecture, you wind up gravitating one way or another anyway. It's, a, it's almost a knife edge. But uh, I did go to tonight school uh, for four years, largely because of financial reasons. And uh, I decided to get a, a real architect's degree only when threatened by the draft. It was like four years, of, uh, four years more of school, which I hated, versus three years of the army. And I figured that the uh, cost-benefit ratio was for four years of architecture. Uh, all this time, I had been working for firms in New York City, uh, summers, full time when I was going at night, which was four years. Uh, part-time when I was in school, and I was getting a, a good idea, I think, of reality there, which is different from reality here. Uh, New York is a, a much tougher place for an architect to make a living, and uh, I was beginning to figure a few things out, like the guys I worked with who were out of school already usually had to have a second job somewhere if they had a family, for instance. and. The other thing I figured out that no one in New York was doing architecture. Uh, maybe one person out of 10, one person out of 20 would be getting work to do inside an office that would be reasonable to call architecture uh, uh, as defined in school. Uh, as a result of all this, after eight years of that, I was beginning to move on to whatever the next thing was already, although it took me several years to, to figure that out several years later to realize that I had made a decision at one point in my life without ever realizing I would made a decision. But my last year in school, I made a movie of a park in New York City for a city planning course. And that really got me turned on to some ideas that weren't coming out in school. And basically, the idea was that whatever people do in their environment is much more of an environmental determinant than whatever the designers do to define it. 
And I didn't know what to do with that information. The only thing I knew at that time was that interest, it was much more interesting to make movies than it was to <laughs> consider go going ahead further with uh, making a living in architecture. The fantasy I had after graduating was to be a freelance draftsman about three days a week. Uh, I was paying $56 a month rent at the time, so I didn't need a lot to live on and had an eight millimeter camera and that film is pretty cheap and then I was going to spend a couple of years sort of half time drafting and half time making movies to learn how to do that and that was going to be the next thing. Uh, well there was a change in plans and I found myself out in LA and getting married to someone who was uh, in that first class at UCLA uh, and out here, it seemed that uh, if I wanted to make movies and had to earn a living, uh, a, a full-time living, that the most reasonable thing to do would be to go into city planning, which was also where the movie had been taking me. And at the time, Gruen Associates were apparently the best place to go in the city. They had had a reputation, at least had reached New York. And I had a friend from school who had a job there, and he got me a job interview, but somehow, Everything they did was tied into federal money, and it was, that was not going to loosen up until January 1st, and it was three months before January 1st, so some, something had to be done. I wound up working for LA City in the planning department for three years, uh, first fantasizing I would make that movie in the course of uh, employment. That never happened, but I did get caught up in city planning until another light bulb dawned on me one day there that the whole name of that game was not really to plug into reality, not to create uh, documents or plans that would really be implemented, but to create things that were so absurd that no one would want to implement them and therefore they could keep on chugging along irrelevantly without political flack. Well, uh, that that perception corresponded with something else and the combination was pretty potent to me. Uh, most of that two and a half to three years I spent on the city plan, which was an incredibly challenging kind of thing for LA, as you saw from uh, David's slides, that there's no defining this place. And it's an absolute paradox to make a plan for LA. Well, at some point, I did something that seemed to fit that definition as part of a very small two-person task force that they spun off from the major planning group because we were making trouble and they wanted us out of their hair. And they decided to go along with our thing. And when I saw how they were going to go along with it, which was, again, to make it irrelevant, I said, no, I can't take it. So I ran out and uh, wrote something for the LA Free Press and then approached the LA Times to see if I can get a freelance assignment. At that point, the new light bulb flashing was that it's better to tell people about what's going on in the world uh, or what's going to be foisted on them, which I, maybe overlaps a bit of what Rick's been doing, uh, than to fantasize that you're planning it and not have it happen. Uh, well, uh, my entree to the Times, ironically, was Art Seidenbaum, who is now going to be my replacement. But he helped me get the job, or the, fr the freelance assignment. And over six years, I wound up writing about various things, most of them which had to do with LA in some sense or another. That particular thing has run its course. And uh, I guess the next thing I'm going to do is go north and teach and probably do some writing. But uh, to me, the lesson is that some people can stick with one thing and other people for various reasons keep changing and go on to other stuff. Maybe they get impatient. Uh, architecture is interesting because just as it's a uh, hybrid of rational, linear, scientific, uh, left brain kind of thinking on one hand and intuitive, visual, mystical, right brain kind of thinking, uh, it's, it's also an area that allows a lot of change in a person, and you could still stay in there if that's your temperament. Uh, Philip Johnson might be an example of that, starting out as a Miesian and then going slightly crazy in his old age, and then coming back to something that's not as crazy as his uh, 
uh, New Harmony, Indiana, sunscreen or whatever it was to cite one example, but finally plugging into reality with something like the IDS building in Minneapolis, which is a very disciplined building full of fantasy. Uh, Mies, of course, never having any fantasy uh, after, after his early sketches and uh, Philip Johnson in his middle period never <coughs> having any discipline. But it's a, it's a good tent to be in. And at the same time, we have, I guess, right now, a panel of people who somehow crawled out from under the tent anyway, as big as it was. I uh, unfortunately came here late and didn't hear what had been gone over. And I don't know if what's been said here has been sort of leading to anything. Uh, and I don't know what happened last week with the conventional architects. Uh, did, did anything come out of that? Well, they didn't have it. Oh, <laughs> you can't rely on architects. <laughs> it's, uh, I guess the Mavericks are more reliable. Yeah, what, what, what is he referring to? Uh, Shelley was going to line up a, a group of straight architects like Eric Moss and, <laughs> uh, and Tom May and Jim Stafford or something, and they were supposed to put on the straight show, and then we were supposed to follow it up with a, <laughs> the other show. <laughs> uh, I've been told they're going to do it the first of the year. <laughs> Maybe one of the, the morals of this story with all the people here is that labels are uh, not very useful. And, you know, people, people are people. They do what they do. They change their minds about things and uh, they go on. Uh, there, there may be a question to be raised about what, you know, is, is there such a thing as architecture anymore? Uh, I'm, I'm really wondering. Uh, one of my problems in trying to write about architecture in LA was finding that there wasn't an awful lot of it. And that the LA Times, uh, I found out only after they threw me out, decided I wasn't covering whatever of it there was. But it, seem, it seems to me that the lines are very fuzzy. Uh, architects are not really needed anymore in any practical sense. They're, uh, they're optional. People can put up buildings without them. And people aren't putting up many buildings anyway. And one value, I think, of a architectural training, uh, whatever that is, it, it's defined very variously in different places is that it, uh, it's just, if it's done well, it gets you into thinking about a complicated process. It doesn't give you any answers. And if your mind finally gets that kind of self-confidence that you can solve problems, it can apply to other situations too. Um, whatever. Uh, I think uh, someone ought to probably compile a list of people who studied architecture. I know. Uh, John Denver did, which is not a, a recommendation as to <laughs> how it might uh, condition your brain and free you to be creative or anything. But uh, Antonioni did, and he was a good movie maker up to one point. Uh, there are politicians who've been ar studied architecture. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of people. And it's, it's curious. I don't know. Like, law is posited as one of those great multi-purpose professions that can prepare you for anything. It uh, prepared us for Watergate, finally. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm digressing right now, but someone once said if there were women in the Nixon administration, uh, there wouldn't have been a Watergate. Well, there weren't any architects in there either. <laughs> That's a, another good thing to point to. <laughs> but I guess what I'm trying to do is break down the notion of architecture. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't exist to me as a nice hard-edged thing, and uh, an old, you know, even even going into into teaching, if an architect goes into teaching, he's really into something other than architecture too, and that has to be one of the biggest outlets for architects. Uh, about four years ago, someone at UCLA told me. Uh, something that I found amusing, uh, for other reasons than intended, but that. Uh, I'm trying to get the quote right. When we went to school, this was a person on a faculty, we had a saying that the B students wind up working for the C students and the A students go into teaching. 
Uh, if so, that's a terrible commentary on the profession because it means that the, uh, the best people immediately remove themselves from the game. Uh, I don't think it was true. It's probably uh, A students work for B students and C students, uh, C students work, uh, uh, work for A and B students, etc. All the permutations are possible. It was just a silly remark that someone was trying to use to rationalize uh, maybe a little bit of uh, uh, regret for not for having pulled out of the real world, but uh, at this point, architecture is very undefined. Someone I know is claiming to have a notion of how offices are going to have to reorganize themselves in the next generation. The uh, the ideal model, according to this person, was Saarinen's office until recently. That. It was set up as a corporation to deal with other corporations as clients, and yet it produced uh, well-received monument buildings. Uh, and even the successor firm uh, of uh, Kevin Roach and Dinkaloo uh, were able to keep that succession of monuments going, maybe even better than Saren and himself. Did any of you go to see Alan Temko <coughs> yesterday at, at USC? Well, he supposedly showed slides. I don't know if it, I don't know what Roach and Dinklu have been doing, but that kind, that particular thing, that was the ultimate hybrid of the 50s and 60s to uh, make money and do good work, uh, apparently is not going to work anymore. And I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. My view of the world is that it's too big and things have to break down somehow. And that a firm that big can't do all the good, all the kinds of good work that are needed to be done because they can only do big jobs. Uh, I don't know if, um, if an individual practitioner can do it, but the, the business is right now in a huge state of flux and it's also in a state of depression, obviously. I don't know, I don't know what uh, employment records are from, for recent students. Do you guys ever have to deal with that? <laughs> at, at UCLA, I know they used to pride themselves on saying that most of their graduates find a job within two years after graduating. <laughs> what are you guys doing here? That's what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. Uh, Elsa, do you want to I studied in South Africa at Cape Town University and I really wasn't sure I wanted to go into architecture when I started. I was more interested in land and land reclamation, soil erosion, forestry. And friends of mine inspired me or thought they inspired me into studying architecture and I worked in South Africa for about five years in small offices and was very happy that I'd chosen this profession. I thought of buildings as monuments and sculpture and it was very exciting working on them. The offices were small and the buildings I had control over. And um, unlike Rick, who thinks that there's going to be a revolution, a, a civil war. During my student days, every year one said, in five years, there's going to be the revolution. We're all going to be, have our throats slit in our beds by the blacks, and we deserve it, and there's nothing we can do about it, and it still hasn't happened. So I don't think his civil war is going to happen either. I think that things go on for a long, long time in an intolerable way without any actual change happening. I and my husband left South Africa partly because of the political situation there and not agreeing with it. And we moved to England. And there, my disillusionment began. I worked in a large liberal office and I discovered that there was compromise, that there were no principles, no morality was practiced. And after a few years, 
of, of really becoming more and more disillusioned about what was happening in, in London, in England, in architecture, <coughs> and the feeling that buildings were built without any relationship to people or cities. I decided to get out, and I got out by starting a family. And to me, that was a, a commitment of my time. And some women work full time, raise their families, and it's a matter of choice what one's priorities are. My feeling was that the family deserved more of my attention than the evenings that I didn't see it as clearly then as I do now but I don't see why a woman now should live the double life in a short day. And I, I personally have never done that. And Glenn was saying that this indicates a lack of commitment to whatever I'm doing. And I, I can't agree with him. <laughs> um, I had three small children fairly close together. I didn't actually stop practicing architecture. I, I went into freelance work doing houses, swimming pools, remodelings. And at this point, I really didn't very much want to touch architecture. And I felt that the way to go was into landscape. Particularly in England, there seemed to be a great deal of scope to affect what was happening in the country by becoming a landscape architect and working for the government in one of the ministries in the field of public recreation and forestry and <coughs> reclamation of mining lands, landscaping of highways. And at the point where I was ready to start work, I studied part-time. Um, my husband found was offered an irresistible job in Los Angeles. And I and the children were uprooted. And I found that the transition was, was not easy, as it wasn't my choice. But, um, and all my connections were broken, and I really felt very dislocated for a while. I now feel very much I'm in transition. I've been working small scale, the kind of work where I can give my children the, the attention I feel they deserve, and I can give my work the attention it deserves. They do impinge on one another, but there's latitude on both sides, and, and I feel that it's, um, it's a very acceptable solution for me. I'm, I'm not losing touch with my profession. And it's, it's a period where it is freeing me for other study and freeing my mind for all sorts of ideas, the kind of thing that I think John talked about. I think coming into Los Angeles with its diversity and um, multitude of different things happening all the time. and. It has stimulated my social consciousness enormously. And whereas my initial commitment was to the land, I now feel, I don't know why Glenn thinks that he has the, um, he's the only visionary around here, or, or what, <laughs> what the definition of a visionary is. But um, I am in this transition period trying to prepare myself to um, go back into this work of dealing with the land and cities on a massive scale. I sense very much that it has a, an enormous number of political overtones, which um, I'm also trying to um, learn about. Solar energy, all sorts of things which I assume you as students are I hope you students are getting in school, which is something that we didn't come near. 
Um, I'm going to ask Glenn to show a few, very few slides um, to, to illustrate a little of my commitment to the land, I suppose. Can we uh, have the lights? Yeah. This first one is in Norway. <laughs> it's, it's in a park in Norway, and the building is an old farm building using traditional uh, building methods. And this was an idea of mine in my student days, which I never actually carried out, and I was enormously excited to see that it had happened centuries ago and still existed. Next, please. That's another view of the same thing. Marvelous integration of the building into the, into the field. Next, please. This, some of you may know, it's Sea Ranch in Northern California. And again, it's integration of building and, and wild landscape in rather a marvelous way. Next, please. Then following three uh, slides of Yosemite, which, um, as you may know, a new master plan is being prepared at the moment. The, the people who are managing it were hoping to turn it into a massive recreation area and um, destroy the idyllic essence of it. Frederick Law Olmsted, many years ago, saw the necessity of protecting places like Yosemite, and it's now our duty to continue that protection. Next, please. This is transportation, which is another area which is very closely involved in our living, and this is a Yosemite um, solution to the problem of, of the motor car, and it's maybe not an ultimate solution, but it works. It's imaginative and it works well. Next, please. This last one is again forests and, and Yosemite. And uh, that's all I have to show and say. A vision. We're all leaving. Look at all that. <laughs> they don't want the vision. <laughs> I don't know who they are. They're not. <laughs> they're not friends. That's for sure. <laughs> they didn't have chairs. They didn't have chairs. I mean, briefly um, talk about my past, and then uh, I'll show a few slides of the of my vision. Uh, most people have seen it, so I won't bore you. It's, I'll only show 15 very fast. <laughs> uh, but I come from good, solid, middle-class uh, stock, and uh, I was taught very early uh, the drive to earn a dollar and. Uh, my first job was uh, shining shoes, and then I uh, mowed lawns, and uh, I was very good in drafting in high school. That's why I went into architecture, and I like to uh, build things with my hands. I guess my father gave me a workbench when I was five years old, and I got used to that. And then my first job was an office boy at Victor Gruen's uh, back in the summer of 56, I guess it was. and. Uh, College made me, I went to the University of Oregon, and uh, I think it, uh, it makes you aware of a lot of things, but uh, it made me aware of two types of people. Those that did, did with the existing, in other words, they would follow the existing patterns, and they would always search what's been done in the past, and they would never seek a a unique solution to any problem. And then there were those that were were seeking, I would say, I call it unique solutions. And I fell into the latter category, and I found that that was a not, that was in a minority. And it sort of built up a, oh, 
certain amount of rejection, the ability to receive rejection without going under, which uh, helped <laughs> helps later on, and even still helps. And uh, when I got out of school, then I went uh, I went to a number of architectural firms, and I was always seeking those. Types. I went to work for Anchin and Allen and Smith and Williams and. Local architect called Alan Morris that builds all his own houses. Uh, he hangs off the edge of a cliff with a torch in his hand, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I worked for John Lautner, who does unusual stuff for the movie stars and so on. And uh, back east, I worked for a city planner called uh, Charles Blessing. had the same experience that John did. The, the ideas that I was working on were really sort of to be put into the drawer two months later. Uh, and I uh, worked for an architect in San Francisco called, called Henrik Bull, and I became very frustrated. And the, the whole idea in my, at that point was to uh, build a good building, make something unique, interesting. Uh, and so I figured that uh, one way to support myself, which I was always getting in trouble, I had kids and wife and the whole full catastrophe as it's explained uh, that kept me in the monetary market. I couldn't drop out very easily. And so uh, I figured the easiest way to do it was with a uh, teaching credential or some way of, and so that meant going and getting a master's. And uh, I took my master's at Cranbrook where a place which uh, prides itself on giving you complete freedom. And in back in 65, uh, uh, when I took it, uh, it was rather unique. And it spoiled me. Um, it allowed me to open up and really think what I would like things to be. And I haven't recovered from that. Um, from there, I went uh, out here to uh, start an architectural practice. I had an architectural <laughs> practice for a couple of years in Venice and became very disenchanted and uh, got got into teaching then and the teaching acts as a support to uh, to my uh, city, my biomorphic biosphere. And I'll, I'll show that right now. That Brian, uh, it's the next uh, slides there. It's, That isn't it. That's, <laughs> that was <laughs> that was another slide. Same carousel, just keep going. Oh, there. And uh, this is a very large scale. This is the LA Basin, and it was meant to be a completely self-sufficient system, uh, returning the land to a natural state. And uh, those are the Santa Santa Monica Mount. Where's Cyark? <laughs> I think it's Cyark is on the uh, 4,000 foot level on the left there. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it re growth pattern of, of building the city going from a point and it has machines that allow it to expand proportionally. And as it gets larger, it starts to open more land up around it next. I did the same thing for Detroit. I, I, when I moved from city to city, then the city is lucky enough to get a new scheme. <laughs> uh, this, this is a little larger, and then it finally, next, phases everything out, and you keep uh, some places to go down and visit Sunday afternoon. And uh, next, and, it starts to take on a lot of the organic principles, you might say, because it's starting to use the principles that nature designs with, and efficiency of structure and uh, collection of water and responding to the sun and uh, a lot of other things. And uh, this structural pattern, I'm going to go very fast because I'm not here to uh, explain this in depth. I'm just here to show a different direction. Next. Next. And these are structural models. So on. Next. And the growth patterns. And the growth machine. Sun studies. And parks and area densities. 
transportation. And this is what it's like. Is Eric Moss here or did he leave? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Catch me maybe in a couple months at UCLA, you'll see the whole truth. <laughs> uh, this is like in, inside, uh, this is the reservoir down below and the uh, environmental conditions like waterfalls dripping down through and so on. Go on, next. And this is down through the central core. It's even got some circular pipes so like, a, like Eric likes. Next. Next. <laughs> next. This is a typical residential street. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that was sort of like Elsa's slides. And then these are the uh, interior of the living module and looking out at infinity and so on. Next. And this is the living module. I won't go into it. Next. Resp it's very responsive. It opens and closes like a flower, and you can bang off the surfaces and so on. Um, then this is inside. Next. And this is sitting down on the beach at Venice, escaping from the city entirely because it's movable. Uh, next. And then from, I st I've worked on this thing for about 10 years, and it's like something, one person told me the best thing I could possibly do for myself is take all, all this work and smash it and throw it away <laughs> and uh, begin again because it was going to be the death of me. And it's still going. Uh, at one point I did this poster with the intentions of becoming a renowned world lecturer. <laughs> and uh, it, I sent it out all over the world and uh, so on. I got a few replies, but not enough to pay for the fare across the ocean. Uh, and then I went on a lecture tour around the U.S. That I, every year I give about three or four lectures somewhere in the U.S., which is nice, but it's not really getting the message across. So I said, um, see, I, I radically, going through the whole process of being educated as an architect, doing buildings, working in a number of firms, I finally came to the conclusion after my studies at Cranbrook that uh, we were really destroying this earth. And also I think the the psychological and physical environment that people should be living in is not really uh, oriented. Our profession has not oriented towards. And uh, so I'm opposed to really quite a few old and almost all new construction. And so um, now the message has been coming how to get to the how to get to somebody that will listen to me. And um, this was an intention that with this poster to do that. And it didn't didn't make the grade. Next, and so I've uh, it's a sort of upside down. But I've written a movie script uh, on this city, and uh, hopefully, a couple of years from now, I won't have to be doing any talking. I'll just bring in the big the big uh, projector, then we'll all look at the movie. And uh, I've and now it's in its second draft. Uh, I'm discovering some, a lot of things about Hollywood. They, they can't even count the pages. I mean, I used a small typewriter, and uh, they only, their scripts are twice as long. But I figured out using the small typewriter that, that if I used the big typewriter that they used, it would be just as long as the scripts that they read. But they can't figure out that I use small type. They say you only have four, 50 pages or something when they want 100. And so things like, it's being retyped now. <laughs> so, so, in, in reality, this is my uh, first family. Next. And this is my second family. <laughs> Just seven months old. She has a fever tonight. Okay. That's it. I thought, I thought at this time we could just uh, open it up and be quite informal. Uh, probably a lot of people on the panel you might have questions for. Uh, I know this is a rather retarded group and past experiences. Uh, very few questions come 
forward. Uh, I hope it's a little better tonight. Eric. <laughs> uh, I'd like to ask a question uh, of, of the first speaker. I, I don't remember his name, I'm sorry. But uh, an interesting thing has happened in the past couple of days with, with Eldridge Creeper, uh, who in the first place wrote a letter, <coughs> which is an interesting one to the New York Times, announcing that he was coming back to the country and saying that uh, of all the countries of the world, this is the freest and the most democratic. Uh, he's certainly not a Nixon apologist, and he has, I would say, uh, in relative terms, reasonable, uh, let's say, revolutionary credentials. So, uh, it would, interestingly enough, that, that appeared in the newspaper uh, the same day that uh, the story appeared about what the FBI had done to, uh, to Martin Luther King. An interesting juxtaposition, but the, but the reason I mention it is that in view of your opinion, which is, which is shared by uh, the party on your left, I don't mean politically, I mean physiologically, uh, about the fact that there's liable to be a civil war in the country, how, how do you respond to that kind of assessment of the state of this country vis-a-vis -vis other countries uh, in terms of what you think is going to happen? Well, I, uh, I was on the Cleaver caucus of the Peace and Freedom Party uh, to get Cleaver to run as vice president or for presidential candidate because I thought uh, it was the most important thing at that period of time. Uh, I supported Cleaver in the sense when he left and left some uh, fairly wealthy people holding the bag uh, because of my experience with Cleaver. If he'd gone back into jail at that time, he'd have been murdered. Uh, and he knew that, and that's one reason he split the country. I've also read uh, a number of his experiences since he's been in Algiers and traveling around in Korea and China, and uh, particularly his isolation of the last couple of years in, in France. Uh, he's been trying to get back, uh, and um, exactly what's going to happen, I don't know. I think when we talk about freedom, uh, that's one of the problems, adjustments we're going to have to make in this country. Because uh, I think that it's probably proper to say that for the majority of white America, America is certainly probably the greatest freedom, you know, place of freedom in the world. But we have to begin to understand that that freedom is based on other people's oppression. Uh, our oil comes from comes to us because people in Venezuela and the Middle East are oppressed. Our copper comes to us because people in Bolivia are oppressed. And, and this sort of thing. And in that degree, I found that I couldn't be free. I couldn't be free floating on a boat and, uh, off the coast of Costa Rica, knowing that the United Fruit People, uh, multinational corporation, was oppressing Costa Ricans so I could get a banana in Los Angeles. That's a reality. Somehow we have to make every one of us in this room realize that the reason we're here and the reason we can get in an automobile and, and drive down the freeways and see David's billboards is because we're living off the backs of other people in the world. So, uh, so that Eldridge is coming back, I would assume, and I talked to a friend of his, a black woman, this morning, <laughs> Uh, and we were discussing the fact that what it's going to be. Why is he coming back? Does he think he's going to get a free trial? Uh, her opinion was that the climate is different now. It's going to be interesting to raise the reality of how is a black person uh, that is conceived of as a criminal in this country going to get a trial in relationship to some of our great political leaders, presidents and vice presidents, and what they got, and they were certainly criminals. So I, I certainly wouldn't try to speak for uh, Eldridge. Uh, it's certainly going to be interesting to see what happens. I do know that I could feel his isolation and what it must have been like to sit in Algiers and Paris and wherever and see what was going on in this country. Uh, and I have no idea of knowing where he's at or what he's going to do when he gets here. Well, 
you're not really very sympathetic to what he said in principle in terms I mean, you're talking about somebody who, in the first place, had a certain, let's say, predisposition to look negatively on what was going on in this country. And you're looking at somebody who's been in China and Algeria and a number of places that are supposed to represent very progressive states of evolution. And in view of that, I think it's just the comment is an interesting comment. If you assume he's making the comment in order to ameliorate a perspective uh, jury or something, then that's, then that's one way to explain it. But if we actually mean I that, think it's on the, I think it's on the part that I think that uh, I've heard, also heard other comments that he had said about other parts of the world. But I think, you know, I think it's basically true because uh, after all, he's an elitist also. He was, uh, you know, uh, an editor. He had a tremendous amount of freedom uh, for his position. Uh, so I think he's sincere. I don't think it's, I think part of it certainly is considering he's going to be in a trial in America. But uh, I think part of it, it's the reality. I'm not claiming he's wrong. What, what I'm saying is we have to change that, I think. We have to ask ourselves, is this much freedom correct? And should we have it if it costs other people's, you know, if it causes other people to be oppressed? That's what. That's what I'm saying that Americans have to ask themselves. If we use 58 to 60 percent of the world's resources, is that right? Do we have a right to do that? Are we something special that we can do that? And I don't think so. And I think that means we have to adjust. And of all countries, America is, I think, the greatest industrial nation yet around. And we have the greatest opportunity to change society, to change our ways, our priorities, and make it great for everyone. I think we can do that. But it means we have to decide to. Is it your opinion that, that the conditions in the country that, that you would like to change are peculiar to this country? Or, for, for example, do they exist in the Soviet Union? And do they exist in China? Or do they exist in Western Europe? Do they exist in the major industrial and political powers in the country? Or is the United States the only villain on the earth? Oh, no, of course not. So the kind of indictment that you're making, is that an, that's an indictment of Russia and China and Western Europe as well? Or is it just an indictment of the United States? Well, I would, I would say that, uh, in my mind, the country that's leading the world and, and giving us a moral perspective of what's going on is Vietnam. I think that, to me, the fact that Americans could go over with B-52s and bomb that country almost off the face of the earth and then be shot down in the Vietnamese uh, outside a village that was just wiped out by bombs to pick up those people fix their broken arms and put them in uh, prison camps and take care of them much better than any prisoner of wars I've seen. And I have a lot of friends that were prisoners of wars in World War II. Uh, that's incredible. That talks to me about some, something about humanity that we have yet to learn from any religion or anything. So I, I would say that they are the leaders of, of what we're talking about when we're changing society and changing worlds. Uh, as far as China, I don't know. Everything I see about China, I'm extremely impressed with. Uh, Soviet Union, I have some very strong disagreements with Soviet Union. I don't, I don't believe they're what uh, I had you know, thought was a great thing in 1970. Uh, Cuba, you know, I've heard great things about uh, Cuba, people that have been there. But it's really changing the whole priority. It's, it, it's not a competitive thing, which is better or worse, you know. You know, so, hey, let's get on the bandwagon and make the right priorities and get the thing you going. Mean, I, don't, I don't want to turn this into a political debate because it's possible. There's one other thing I'd like to suggest because I think that the picture, the, the picture of the profession and of the world that comes out of the panel is ghastly. And I don't think, in fact, things are quite that ghastly. But in terms, for example, you, you referring to the Vietnam thing, which certainly fits the category of ghastly, it's certainly true that, that, that Russia marched into Czechoslovakia and Hungary and East Germany. It's certainly true that China has done certain things in Tibet for which they shouldn't get the Nobel Prize. And even Ho Chi Minh apparently cut a few throats in his day. 
So the only point is that it seems to me if, you, if you're dealing with those issues and you like to deal with them honestly, that you've got to deal with them on a different scale. That's all. That in fact, it's not Exxon, which is, which is the only bandit around, far from it. I mean, you, all you got to do is listen a little bit to Soltz and Eason or somebody like that to get a picture of the fact that the scale is much more substantial than, than you indicate. And what usually happens in these kinds of discussions is that the opinion which is left is that the United States is this incredible villain for going around and pilfering and pillaging on all these very virtuous people around the world. All right, that, that's not what I was saying, uh, and I'd like to just a short answer and then turn it over to some other panel. I'm an American. I was born and raised in America. If I was in Russia, I'd be fighting to change it in Russia. If I was in Vietnam, I'd be fighting to change it in Vietnam. I happen to be American. I grew up in the South. I was horrified at the racism. Not that I saw in others, but I saw in my own family, my own sister, my own mother, and in myself. I'm horrified at the sexism that I, not I see in others, but what I see in myself. I want to change that, you know. I'm not in this to compete with China and Russia and Vietnam. I'm into it to change the world so we can all have a better place to live. And I have to start changing it myself and then the people that live next to me and next to me. But I'm an American, so that's where I'm working. That's why I came back here. What I saw in Panama told me, hey man, you're American. Get back home and start changing it. And if you do that, maybe it'll take some of the shit off the people in Panama. That's what I'm about. All right. I'd just like to say, if it is shit here, yeah, that at least there is, we feel there's a possibility of changing it in some countries, Russia, notably the Eastern Bloc. It's not possible to make these changes here. Yeah. I think the essence of the freedom is that we feel that there probably is still that possibility. Are there some more questions from the audience? Yes, Ron. I'll ask Chair if he wants to say something about his recent uh, change of renewal. Talk you mean my firing? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. You, you haven't read about it in the paper with the largest amount of space for news in the country, but it's true. Uh, it happened about six weeks, something like that, four or six weeks ago, and I was called in the middle of the week and told I had to be let go because I wasn't doing my job well, etc., etc. I, I think it's uh, political. I can't tell exactly what the reason is, though. And I think the fact that the Times hasn't told anybody about it, but they're making, taking great pains to somehow patch together the semblance of coverage uh, there's going to be an announcement soon that Art Seidenbaum is going to be doing a, a, apparently a weekly calendar piece on architecture, and John Dreyfus, uh, <coughs> who is Henry Dreyfus' son, is going to be doing architectural news for the real estate section. Uh, someone heard that from Seidenbaum, and Seidenbaum also said, okay, he said there's going to be an announcement. I did say that. Uh, my friend said, oh, and are you going to then explain what happened to John in that announcement? He says, well, of course not. <laughs> uh, I don't want to speculate forever about what particular combinations of reasons led to it, because I don't think I'll ever know. They're being very close-lipped. Uh, I, you know, I know that uh, I have to do whatever is next, and I think in my own case that just means getting out of LA. I've been here nine years, and uh, I think LA is sort of like uh, puberty. You, you got to get over it. <laughs> I want to get rid of my acne pimples and, and get on with, with whatever. Uh, I just took a trip to as far north as Vancouver uh, as a sort of a gloss on the question that Rick Davidson had to field. Uh, one of my notions was that Canada was a somewhat better off place than us politically, but uh, I ran into a couple of Americans who were, one was a friend and one was a friend of a friend, pretty intelligent, and apparently they had their own set of problems. But I soured a little bit on Canada, not that I was going up there to live or anything, but 
something very clear emerged there that uh, on the Pacific coast you could fit the, the cities, communities, living environments in two categories. And those are where people seem to take an interest in their own environment, put in some time on maintaining it in a political sense or a psychic sense, and, and those where people just sort of go their own way. Now, LA is really the, the capital of that second category, and I'm, I'm really very relieved that I suddenly don't have ties here. That I think it's a very draining place in that sense. You, can, you have incredible personal freedom here, but you don't have any sustenance from your environment, finally. Uh, there are no social networks that are easily devised and maintained here. And uh, I think ultimately, maybe that's what gets back to my own situation with the LA Times, that a person of my state of mind, uh, writing as I did, uh, arguing for things that I argued for and having expectations about the environment that I did would be perceived as some kind of nut, maybe, or would just not find an audience in the scheme of things, because LA isn't that kind of place. And, you know, I think like Glenn being here doing his cities it embodies the paradox of LA that he'll have the freedom to do something like that, but uh, you also have the freedom to be ignored here in what you're doing. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but it just sort of says where, where my thoughts have been lately. Where would the drugs be any better, say, right now? Uh, I mean, where is a city that is in the United States, let's say, that's any All right, well, just, just on that trip, I saw that possibly Vancouver, definitely Seattle, probably Portland, and definitely the Bay Area all have much better ingredients for uh, sanity and for individual fulfillment in a context. I think context is very important. Uh, San Francisco may be the best because it gets its share of sunlight. When you get further north, uh, you get the dreary drizzles, and that seems to affect people too. But uh, San Francisco has things like going educational institutions, which seem to have been collapsing around LA. And a notion of physical context, a notion of social context, uh, I don't know how I'll plug in up there. I'm just sort of going there uh, with a, maybe a half-time job at Berkeley to start with. But somehow my feeling is that things will work out up there. That it's, uh, may, uh, I came back to LA and saw the smog. And that suddenly seemed to be a metaphor for the whole place, that it's, it's hard to breathe properly here. And up there, you know, the breathing is easier. At least I'm a New Yorker originally. And, Maybe it's just that. Maybe if you're raised in an environment like this, uh, you're better off staying here, and it's harder to exist outside of it. But I have other demands, and it's somehow like I'll be healthier up there. Uh, that you know, it's just a personal assessment, obviously. I didn't quite understand your statement about Los Angeles having a collapsing educational. I, I can't rephrase your your dialogue there. Institutions. And, well, and, and San Francisco not. I don't understand what you mean. Again, that's a subjective assessment. But uh, for one thing, I seem to be getting offers up there and not down here. So that's one way I have to look at it. <laughs> for another thing, UCLA, after nine years, is it 966 they started? Yeah. Still hasn't gotten any accreditation. They've had a hell of a lot of money pumped into that place. Our money. Uh, something isn't working right. USC chased out the best guy they ever had. And Jerry Weisbach, who had taken a, a pretty moribund school and gotten it sort of two thirds of the way back to where it should have been and probably would have gotten it all the way back given some time. He's up in San Francisco studying law. Uh, another thing, you know, there, I, I think there are, there are huge tides in the world. Uh, the, you know, not just individual tides, but when I started telling my friends that the Bay Area seemed to be where I was headed next without really even knowing why, I started getting back information from them. An artist was up there and he said, listen, things are happening up there. I could feel it in the air. The Bay Guardian had an article that said that there's 
someone is keeping track of the artist population and there's a suddenly a south of market artists gallery and studio area that's emerging and uh, people are getting the impression that the artist population there is uh, increasing very spectacularly. The underground paper there, the Big Guardian, is an incredibly substantial thing. It puts, uh, puts the alternative press down here to shame and put also, given its meager resources, puts the establishment press down here to shame. And you know, that, that's an educational institution too, in a sense. Uh, it's the, the daily or the weekly educational institution. I don't sense that happening here. I sense uh, disintegration here. Uh, the LA Times, as the most prosperous newspaper in the country, couldn't sustain a Sunday supplement and had to fold it a couple of years ago. And it's, it's like the tide rushing in and out. I don't think anything is permanent. But right, right now, I think that the momentum is, is receding here in a lot of ways, and it's, it's waxing up there. I, I, don't, I don't think it's well, waning and waxing. I, I think it's a difference. The Bay Area is different than Los Angeles. And I think uh, uh, over the last uh, 10 to 12 years, I've been constantly attracted to the Bay, Bay Area because of its you know, political uh, climate, which is more in keeping with my uh, feelings and the uh, outlook. But the reality is I think Los Angeles represents more of the country. You know, Los Angeles represents what America is all about. And just like if you're going to make any change in California, you've got to change Los Angeles County, or at least Los Angeles County has to go along with you if you're going to get initiative passed or whatever. So politically, at least, although I don't like the physical environment and certainly the smog and lots of other things, politically I've decided that this is an ideal place to work if you're going to make any changes in our society. Uh, and then even within Los Angeles, uh, started looking at, you know, where are some of the things that are happening? And they happen to be, you know, I think on the west side and even down along, along the ocean, there's a lot of tr things. In, so, so where is it you can work and make your major changes uh, and hopefully be felt? So again, I don't think that too often we get into comparing one in a straight line comparison. They're different areas and they should be considered different and not tried to be, I think, judged as why aren't they the same? Why aren't we like New York? Uh, and, uh, I don't know if the gentleman's still up there is talking about America. <laughs> I'd like to just throw you a statistic for you to consider tonight when you go to the... Yeah, I know. Uh, Congressman, Congressman Royball has been having a nationwide uh, hearings, uh, Senate hearings, and uh, he's come up with a statistic, and you may discount it if you will, uh, or if you want to, but I, from my experience, it's probably correct, that 65 percent of America's senior citizens live in substandard housing, and they pay 75% of their income for it. Now, to me, that is a tremendous indictment on our country, given the fact that this is now, you know, almost the 200th anniversary. And so that's sort of the sayings that I don't care what they're doing in Russia or China or anything, that's a statistic I would like to see change. I relate to it as an architect, as someone that's concerned about housing, and whether you're uh, racist or anti-Semitic or whatever, you know, when you're talking about the elderly, you know. So these are some of the attitudes I think that we're going to have to change. And uh, uh, there's a number of other statistics that I think that point in some ways, although this isn't really the point you're trying to raise, this is, of course, a country which gets its opinions and determines its, ta its taste from the youth. You know, it determines its hairstyles and its colors and its packaging and its language and everything. And in that sense, if you have any longevity chronologically, you're much less useful. You're not a market. 
the, to, to sell things to and so on. So that's part of the point that, that you raised, only turning it around. You're looking to the youth, and the people who sell things are looking to the youth, too. Which is, which is, is that an excuse? Are you offering that as an excuse? Absolutely not. It's just a fact. I, the only, I, I don't want to be put in a position of, of trying to defend any of those things. I mean, obviously, they're, they're, the inequities are legion. I think everybody knows those things. The only, the only point I wanted to raise was that there are a few others that, if not having equal time, at least ought to be acknowledged. That's all. I wouldn't mind asking another question. <laughs> uh, I'd, like, I'd like to ask uh, a Castillo a question. Uh, he's not too tired. He made a, made a statement about, uh, about how architects aren't needed any longer, whatever exactly that means. Uh, in, that, in that context, I mean, it might be useful to define what needed means, and also in that context to say, if architects aren't needed, given the priorities of the civilization, who is needed? Uh, that's a sigh of deja vu. Uh, it, it almost sounds like the kind of stuff that the AIA was saying at their conventions in the 60s about the team leader. And the architect is the inevitable team leader of a multidisciplinary group comprised. You know, I, I, it, sound, it, sounds, it sounds like rhetoric, you know. I, I would say this. Needed means it's not, it's not a value judgment on my part. Uh, I, di I didn't mean it to be my opinion. I'm looking at what happens when society votes with its feet. And when you look at the unemployment rates for architects right now, they're staggering. I heard figures about over 50% in Boston and approaching that kind of percentage in New York City. And it's high here, too. And it, it ultimately means, now part of that is cyclical, but there's, there's, really, there's really no absolute necessity for architects in, in the country. Uh, Sweet, uh, street sweepers are, strictly speaking, more necessary to the functioning of... Well, aside from the cynicism, I mean... It's I'm not like cynicism. It's, it's, a, it's taking other people's assessments and not injecting my some, own... Uh, if there's somebody south of Market Street who you're enamored of who is painting a picture, are they needed? I mean, in terms of the definition, I don't think it's rhetoric at all because I think what you're doing is you're looking for a kind of a standard of utility which says if there's somebody to pick up the papers lying around, they're, they're necessary, you see? But if somebody is painting a picture, never mind architect, somebody, somebody writing a poem in Greenwich Village, they're not needed either. True, you see? yeah. Poets, poets are even less needed than architects in the sense that I'm saying. And again, it's not my own assessments. I personally don't read poetry. I, there's a, you know, a particular peculiarity about my own the way I get off on aesthetic experiences, the poetry isn't one of them. But you know, that's not to put them down. It's just that they're even less needed than architects. But I think the AI itself has some statistics that 80% of the construction volume put in place is done without benefit of an architect. That's a statistic that bears out what I'm saying, too. Now, if you want to look at um, but all you're really doing, you see, is you're reinforcing or you're confirming the values of the society that, that you apparently are not very satisfied with. I'm not, yeah, I'm not satisfied, but you can't, you can't swim upstream through a glacier. You know, that's, if, if people don't want something, you're not going to sell it to them. And I don't, I think Eric's needed, you know. I think it's a, <laughs> I think that's what he's worried about. <laughs> There's plenty of Broadway stores to do, Eric. <laughs> I, have some, uh, I have some concern for that, and so do you, which is why you're doing this traveling road show. But what I, <laughs> but what I, but what I, think, what I think is not, even though I have some motivation of my own, as, as is everybody who's sitting up there, you're sitting and you're talking to an audience of students, and, you, and you're giving an impression of a profession and an, I mean, you're asking people what the hell they're doing here. 
And why are they doing this? Why are you taking it so personally? I mean, you, you seem to be a very bright guy with a lot of mental subtlety, and you're asking questions that are sophomoric. What's the role playing you're doing right now? It's conceivable that I'm not as bright as you say, and you've got to translate these things. But I know you are. I, I can say that all that. If we, if we follow through uh, to the conclusion or, or accept what you're saying, then what you're really saying is everybody here is wasting their time. No. You know, life, life isn't categories and labels. Uh, if anyone here senses they're wasting their time, they probably left with that contingent, and that's fine. <laughs> Even worse down the street. I mean, no, they did what they needed to do, and no one is wasting their time. They're not. They, they left, and they felt they might have been if they stayed longer. But uh, you, you want to somehow wrap this thing up, and it, it, nothing's going to get wrapped up. There's feathers floating around the room, and you're not going to turn them into a, uh, a steel frame section or something verbally. Uh, the world is in flux. Why? Why do you want? I, I, you know, I think all your questions have been to come up with some incredible answer to answer everything. <laughs> I, I don't. I certainly, I certainly didn't mean to indicate uh, that I didn't think, uh, uh, you know, people sitting in this room and you know learning architecture, you know, is is not useful. Uh, my whole approach was the fact that because of our priorities, you know, is that's going to make them useful or not. I think what we've seen in architecture, and maybe this is a little bit what John was speaking to, is that when I was studying architecture, it was the College of Architecture and Allied Arts, and that you didn't have an interior design department. It was, I think my junior year was the first time they had an interior design department. There wasn't an uh, a landscape department. There was a landscape architect that was teaching in the College of Architecture and trying to get a department and, and so forth and so on. And when you compare architecture today with the architects that we call the masters, uh, you know, where they did the whole shop. You know, they, they designed it, they built it, they did the furniture, they did the, the glass, leaded glass, the whole business. Then you saw the architect as the master builder. And what's happened is the architect, I think, has stepped out and he's given up that. He's given up interior design. He's given up landscape. He's given up this. He's given up structures. And to that degree, he's constantly become a businessman. And I think that's one of the things that's happened in architecture. The architects have given up the art of it and have been left with the business. And that is what we're finding, what builders from one end of the country to the other know. Look, if you want to make money, you know, you don't go to an architect, you go to a businessman. Now, the fact that he has an architectural license or whatever, first, is he a businessman? And I think that architects shouldn't be businessmen. You know, I don't think... The architect didn't do that through choice. He did that as a response to a very intense industrial system. <coughs> and uh, if any of you are paying attention to the presentation of the SC students, in which their impression of some of the power of the system, say an airport, a standard uh, building type, as we would refer to in architecture, their impression was that people were the hamburger in the meat grinder. And that was the whole apparatus that was set up. And that ought to be pretty damn obvious to you. Now, when you make a comparison between China and a, a highly energy intensive country like the United States, where all their energy is physical energy. There's a direct translation between food and energy. That's like about the most efficient machine possible to use. They have solved some real problems that architects all over the rest of the world have been able to solve concerning human beings and people and the way they live. So I think we have to concentrate on some of those things. Architects have become specialists and lost in the whole system. It's time they got back to putting in that unique humanistic quality which supposedly they're supposed to have as a result of their education and training and sensitivity to, to human beings. I hope that was the message that the students brought out in that uh, little presentation, which unfortunately wasn't. That's a great
great Catholic life. Well, I, I think the, the students here have to think about the fact that most of them will be working as technicians and not as master architects and decide if that's the way they want to go. The, the great humanistic thing, the thing that I'm striving for, the reason why many of us don't continue practicing architecture, is it's, a, it's still possible, it's a different field, I think, and one can move from architecture into these other fields, planning, landscape, political planning, but direct architecture doesn't, at the, as it is at present, give much scope for people for, with sensitivity to have an impact on what they're doing. And I don't hear from any of the students any questioning at all. I the field of architecture are helping architecture? I couldn't tell that. Leaving the field of architecture, do you think you're helping? Yes. Uh, I, I did. Because I think that the impact of building isolated buildings is, is not helping anyone, and I see a need for greater overall interaction between environment and buildings and planning. But I still don't see how it's helping architecture. I'm sorry, but it's a block. I don't see how you leaving is going to help architecture. I don't see how my staying is going to help architecture. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I left. I haven't had anything to say yet. I left architecture uh, <laughs> because uh, I, it, 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 um, it bored the shit out of me designing boxes, number one. And number two, uh, I didn't want to put any of my good friends in any boxes. And uh, it seems that within the, with, 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 I mean, what's happening is boxes. And so I figured, well, maybe uh, architects don't know anything, or maybe no one knows anything. And, and so I decided to uh, not to do the boxes, but to go out and try to learn something. And I didn't even know what I wanted to learn, but I, I wanted to learn something besides what I was taught, which was how to design a box. And um, also the, the, the whole fact of the, 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 this incredible purist attitude that, that architects have towards their boxes about you know, about that it, it doesn't go well with anything next to it unless it looks like it or, you know, is it the same kind of a family of box or whatever. But um, I think that, uh, that, I mean, everybody has a lot to learn in this country. I think the architects probably have a lot more to learn than most people. And uh, I don't... In my case, I don't feel I dropped out of architecture. I just wish you'd all join me, you see. <laughs> I didn't drop out, I moved sideways. You get some covered wagons and drive <laughs> <laughs> you know, Eric, I really don't think there's hope for you. But maybe the question is this. Just go away. <laughs> is working for Bird Carrera being in architecture or being out of it? Is, is working for a schlock office like Luckman being in architecture or being out of it? I mean, it's, it's crazy to, to draw the lines based on the worst examples, based on the self-definitions of some of the people who've created the problems. They're the most evident. They're the most evident people, but we're, we're allowing ourselves, we're getting sucked into their own, their own definition of what architecture is. I think, though, that if, if I was... If so, working for the Los Angeles Times. That, that is an architecture, very clearly. I, you know... Nobody implied it was architecture. <laughs> <laughs> when, when did I do that? I said no one implied it oh. was architecture. But if, if what you're saying is that in order to do what's proper, you have to enlist in a proper institution or corporation or whatever, then how, I mean, how in your terms is it justifiable in doing what you do, which is to write about architecture and planning, would one choose to work for the Los Angeles Times? I worked for them for, for as long as it was possible to do whatever <laughs> I personally decided was, uh, you know, reasonable or, or effective by my standards, and barely so. 
uh, that's the decision everybody makes. You know, you, you make your own decisions, and uh, I think it's tough to make definitions for other people. Well, so is it conceivable to you that, for example, some student gets out and goes to work in Leftman's office for as long as he thinks it's possible to do something like that and leave? Well, what, what are the effects of that? Has anything ever come out of that? I don't know. I mean, we're just, we're just hypothesizing. I mean, you don't have to pick on that office, and it's conceivable that's not fair. But the only, the only thing I'm asking for is a little consistency, that if you're using an office like that with, with, with the kind of reputation that it obviously has, and looking at participation in an office like that as an indictment of the person who does it, then in order to be consistent, it seems fair that you wouldn't work for the Los Angeles Times. I don't want to indict people who do it. I want to indict the process of being there, regardless of who, who the participant is. Uh, I'm saying that if anybody, and whoever they are is irrelevant, is, is working for a place like Luckman, they're not participating in architecture. They're doing something else. They're, uh, they're helping uh, the functioning of a machine that's set up to distribute political contributions and to accept fees for legally complying with the building codes through the preparation of contract documents. That's, you know, that's not architecture. I, th I think we're somewhat missing the point, uh, as, at least as sitting here you know, in a college of architecture, a school of architecture, and that if, if someone asked me, gee, what do you suggest that I study uh, to get educated? Uh, I would suggest that they study architecture. I think it's the best education you can get. I think you, if you come out of architecture school, you know, you have a much broader view of the world. Uh, you have a, a, a greater variety of directions to go, and I think that's somewhat that re is represented here, that while we're all architects, we've gone off in the different directions. I think there are a lot more things we can do, and we've learned that in college that we can use in practice in everyday life that may not be doing architecture. Uh, so I think it's one of the most practical and well-rounded areas of education, just general, not that you're going to be an architect. Uh, and I think uh, I'd like to see more people go into architecture. I'd like to see more people you know, study the history of architecture. Uh, because I think the history of architecture is one of the best histories, you know, of what's happening on this planet. Uh, so I'm not here knocking architecture, the study of architecture. Yeah, but it, it also boils down to how how it's being taught. I mean, you can go, you can go per, you can go through a school and come out uh, totally ignorant of what you know, many of the aspects you're talking about being shown you. You know, it's like. It's like self-discovery. Maybe you self-discovered by going to Panama or something, or uh, getting kicked around by a certain amount of. It's all there in architectural education. It's, a, you know, it's all there. They say all the right things at one time or another. They do. I mean, in an average architectural school. I think you know, it was after this self-discovery took place when you got uh, license. Invaluable experience in, in a political arena that, uh, that allows you to get in touch with people like Fever and what they had to say and these kinds of things. And there was a self awareness that happened. And, and in fact, you know, you're telling us today that some experience happened which implied that you were crazy and then you come around after a long period of time and you're not crazy and you see that one of the big problems that you like to focus on has to do with housing for the elderly. How it is that you can't get yourself again with this talent that you have in terms of creation and environmental design to begin to solve the problem, that specific problem that you want to focus on, of housing for the elderly. Well, that part of this goes back to when I was practicing architecture in Florida. And as I think I mentioned earlier, that uh, my stepfather was a well-known cardiologist. He his he could open doors up and down the East Coast for me. And not just myself, but some other architects. And we were putting forth what you know, were really important you know, plans to help housing problems in Dade County. Uh, and they weren't being picked up. It took me many years to realize they weren't being picked up for a very important reason. They weren't part of the planning process. 
Since I've been in California in 1961, I started living in Venice, California. Uh, I've been struggling there for a long time. And things aren't happening. And they're not happening for a very important reason. They're not supposed to happen. You know, we're not supposed to get housing in Venice because they don't want poor people, black people, brown people, old people living in Venice. It's going to be a Miami Beach of the West Coast. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's going to be. Uh, you start looking at the downtown central plan. What's going to happen to the poor people in the downtown central plan? If you listen to Watson, you know, and any of them, they say, oh, they'll go to Venice. But if you look at Venice, everyone's being kicked out of Venice. Oh, they'll go to South Central Los Angeles. Well, that's South Central. There ain't no, nothing going on down there. There's nothing happened in South Central since the Watts riots, you know. So that's when I started turning to politics because I found out that from the experience of Fuller, from the turn on of Fuller in 1958, you know, and I said, wow, I'm going to run out and do all these great things that all of us want to see done. And they weren't being done, not only by me, they weren't being done by the American Institute of Architects, by the American Institute of Planners. Well, something, I said, why not? You know, and I said, because they're not. Because they're a service organization and they're after the buck. <laughs> <laughs> Part of your reason for the criticism, as I hear it, of America is because of America. And I hear coming very strongly from your criticism of the profession that you were a part of, and that it's almost as if you've left the profession without trying to stay there to change it. Because in a sense, you're the individual that's spreading those green through a glacier that John Pasteur made reference to. And I don't say that in a derogatory way, I say it with a great deal of admiration. My question again comes back to why it is that you leave the profession as opposed to staying within. Pretty much like you're staying here to criticize the political system or the overall spectrum of oppression of people and so forth. Why it is that you leave the profession and you don't stay there to begin to try to change the system that the plan refers to or the John or the uh, you know, Greenberg refers to? Well, one, I don't think I've left the profession. I think the profession has left not me, but the principles of which I was told to believe in and I do believe in. That's what's happened. I have not left that. You know, I've been trying to find that and stay with it. When we started fighting in Venice in 1961 to stop a code enforcement program that was designed to wipe out the community and wiped out 25% of it, the American Institute of Architects wasn't around. When we went to City Hall and police Los Angeles police stood at the doors of City Hall and locked us out because we didn't own property. You know, the architects weren't around. You know, when I got arrested for trying to speak, you know, in what supposedly is a First Amendment right in this country in City Hall about planning and architecture in Venice, the architects weren't around. When I asked the architects, American Institute of Architects, where they were when it came to the Vietnam War, they said they couldn't take a position on the Vietnam War, you know. So I don't feel I've left the architectural AIA. You know, I think they've left. Now there's a void, and I think it's in the process of being created. We're going to fill that void. Out of the hell that we call Vietnam, you know, we're going to create something. And I think we have a tremendous opportunity. I'm afraid we're sitting on a time bomb. We've got to work very hard. But I don't feel I've left it. When I go to the Coastal Commission and I'm yelled and screamed at by fellow architects for what I'm doing in Venice and that I'm against progress and I'm against this and against that, you know, I say, man, they're crazy, not me. They're destroying the planet, not me. You know, because they don't offer any alternative. They don't offer any plan. So yes, I'm very angry at the American Institute of Art, but I haven't left, I don't think. I think they're the ones that are crazy, not me. Right, uh, a question about like personal design in Los Angeles, since you both are fairly well acquainted with Los Angeles area, and uh, you say that sort of architects aren't needed, and that it might be better for people to design their own sort of space. Does that sort of ultimately uh, end up in chaos like the a couple of sets of slides that you had on sort of unique buildings in Los Angeles or the architect, not architect, because the surface can uh, 
is it useful for someone who can control spatial design and sequence in a certain scale? Is that person useful to uh, you know community or larger urban structure? <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it first. Okay. What I mean is, since you two are here and you have, you know, a great knowledge about Los Angeles and the specific areas about it, I sort of want to hear you talk about some of the uniqueness of it and uh, something like that. I'm getting sort of a contradiction to your question. I don't think it necessarily applies specifically to LA, does it? What you're asking? That's a it's it's a very it's an intellectual issue. Uh, should should design be in the hands of a an expert, especially if it comes to? Are you talking about residential design now? Well, in in a good system. Any, any good social cultural system, there's the equivalent of modularity that somehow arises. Uh, certain things are taken for granted and the parts are shuffled according to individual needs. Uh, traditional societies have building forms that work that way. Uh, Western societies until the Industrial Revolution did. And one of the goals, I guess, of the uh, modern movement was to do a similar thing, to create a uh, a, a generally assumed basis for points of departure. Uh, people like Voxman saw it in terms of industrialization and standard parts that could be arranged in an awful lot of combinations that might have been infinite. Uh, we, we don't have that. We don't have a society that lets the professionals design the, let's say, the I hate to call it the infrastructure because that has a very specific meaning that isn't what I mean, but the analog of the infrastructure and let people then arrange it according to their demands. I think that would be an ideal state. Uh, 